Lee Felsenstein introduces us to the Maker Revolution at Maker Faire 2013. This segment is brought to you by Full Sail University. With Hack5, I'm Shannon Morse coming to you from Maker Fair 2013, and I have Lee Felsenstein. Hi, Lee, how are you? Hi, fine, thanks. Now, you just gave a talk all about the... Oh, how do you even describe it? You have to tell me all about this talk. Well, I'm an old revolutionary, and in fact, I got into the whole area of uh, personal computer technology as a result of my participation in a revolution in 1964. And uh, I see, I, of course, that I got involved in the personal computer revolution. And now I see the maker movement, and I can identify it as a revolution. Unfortunately, most of the people, almost all the people involved, won't be able to do that until afterwards. They look back and say, geez, we made a revolution. Why is that? Well, the biggest, the most important effect of a revolution is its aftermath. It has unintended and unexpected consequences. Hopefully they're good consequences. So, for instance, the 1964 Berkeley Free Speech Movement that I was involved in did not think of itself as a revolution, but it wound up overthrowing an existing order, which was the order of in loco parentis, in which the university acted as in place of the parent for the student. And it had vast consequences in terms of the counterculture. It unleashed an awful lot of forces and a lot of people who decided, forget about this university thing, I'm going to the Haight-Ashbury and try to build a community there that I can live in. Now, so you must be from the Bay Area. Can you give me a little bit of history about yourself? Well, I was born in Philadelphia, uh, and I left in 1963 at the age of 18 to go to Berkeley, University of California, uh, in electrical engineering. And I finally graduated in 1972, but that was after a hiatus of four years. Uh, I was here in uh, for the 1964 Berkeley Free Speech Movement, participated in it, tried to implement some technological solutions to some of the problems I saw there, failed in most of it, but got to see firsthand the communication structure uh, that grew within that event and it was like they both grew at the same time. Uh, and I could see non-hierarchical communication handled by telephone mostly and then also uh, higher, you could call it hierarchical but anyway it's a uh, mimeograph, I help run the mimeo machines and uh, I could see people offering resources and uh, placing requests for resources I'm, I want, I need this, uh, somebody else has that, we need that somebody offered haircuts for those who needed it um, and that all worked. The, in the aftermath, when we, we won and won big. Uh, the university basically caved and adopted our approach, which was that the U.S. Constitution governs speech on campus, nothing else. Uh, and the, some analysts at that point said, you know what happened was that a group of like 20,000 strangers, who was the student body, suddenly had their barriers lowered for communication with each other and they could communicate with each other where there's previously they would have no basis for it and that communication i could see it was right had allowed this group of strangers to become a community for at least the duration of that struggle and community is a very uh, a very attractive thing i wanted life to be like that all the time so I asked the question of what technologies would be necessary and useful in furthering that goal. That led me through the underground press, it led me through an investigation of media, a non-hierarchical media, and I ran into some other people who were making the same explorations and had come up with a computer. In 1970, I just realized that computer, a network of computers would get me what I wanted, but then I said, where are you going to get a computer? Which led me into personal computers so that by 1974 uh, I had been involved with a uh, the first social media that computer that those other people's had rounded up a mainframe I was the engineer trying to make that work without adequate knowledge and we put terminals in public the community memory system as a bulletin board and fortunately we did not restrict its categories they were open categories so the usage exploded 
Uh, it was tremendous. I said, this is it. This is, this is what I saw back in 1964. But we need better hardware. So my, my, that's what I do is hardware. So uh, I uh, put together a specification for a computer terminal that would attract a computer club around itself, grow a computer club around itself. This was assisted by my uh, being introduced to the ideas of Ivan Illich, I-L-L-I-C-H, a uh, philosopher who talked about uh, tools for conviviality. That was his book just the year before. Um, so that meant that I basically designed a personal computer, published the specification in 1974. In 1975, the, the Altair was announced, which was sold as a mini computer, and it sure was mini, and it was just barely a computer. But what I could do is design the rest of the circuitry for a terminal, put it on a board and plug it in, which created a new animal. That's it's a, a computer which had its terminal built in and shared memory with its main memory. So access to the terminal was as fast as access to the memory. That allowed computer games, and it also reduced the price radically of the uh, system. So we were off and running. Now that must have been awe-inspiring, the, the whole fact that you were a part of that revolution when so many people were getting involved in computers. Well, you know, I didn't really feel awed at the time, but, but I did know something big was going on and I could participate. I mean, I knew, there was a phrase, something about the Buckminster Fuller, I'll start again. <laughs> Buckminster Fuller was interviewed, I think, in 1975 or before, and he was asked what the year of 2000 would look like. And he said, we don't need to think that far ahead even. All the important decisions will be made by 1985. Really? Yes, and that sort of struck me, and it's, oh, we have a responsibility here. And I tried to fulfill my end of that. Uh, so it's not like I went around completely in the dark. No, I knew something was going on. It was a whole lot of work, and I love doing work, especially that kind of work. And uh, everybody sort of took a slightly different uh, approach to it, but moved in the same direction. And, uh, you know, I can't remember being struck dumb by awe, but nonetheless, that first view of the uh, exhibit floor at the... Uh, West Coast Computer Fair in 1977 uh, came close. I believe my dad went to that uh, before I was even born. <laughs> I agree a whole, about 1985, that's the year I was born, so it, it was a good year. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the relationship that you're starting to see between the computers of the early the 60s and 70s and now with the maker movement. Well the maker movement is a kind of generalization and expansion of the whole idea. It all stemmed from, I think, mostly Buckminster Fuller, but through the whole Earth Catalog, which marketed the concept of hands-on technology, why that was important. And that's not what we, we were being told by all of our institutions. We were being told, oh, wiser heads than yours, and maybe you can become one of those heads and tell us what to do. They'll tell us what to do. Um, the uh, the motivation, as far as I could tell, uh, behind the personal computer revolution was just that. We had to get our hands on this technology and tame it, and uh, in taming it, it's taming us. In effect, we have to achieve a symbiosis with it. And very few people were actually saying anything like that. There were excuses like, uh, I want to use it to balance my checkbook and keep recipes for the little woman. Yeah, yeah but that's what we all knew that was a lie. Um, the Maker Fair, the Maker Movement, not just the fair, that's just an event. The Maker Movement is that same uh, tool as toy kind of uh, methodology expanded to all forms of technologies. There isn't anything that's, uh, that's off limits here. And uh, the level of participation uh, and interest is really inspiring to me. I know you look at this and I say, ah, we've had an effect. Yes. Uh, because people expect to do this, they expect open source designs, they expect to be able to learn how to do it. You can't just say, well, that's, you know, for you know, better people than you to know, and it's, you know, don't come bother me, little man. No, no this is uh, open technology that's getting more open. And these are people who weren't 
technologists becoming technologists. These are people becoming citizen technologists. That is to say, not as their primary role uh, and not as their economic role, but uh, as a role in which they uh, get to, again, w mix play with work, mix tools with toys, confuse tools and toys, and uh, to do it all in a, an environment in which it's, it's fun. It's legitimate to have fun. I completely agree. I don't know about you, but whenever I come to Maker Fair, I, I see things that maybe I don't quite understand how they work, and it just gets me so excited, because you, you see how excited the people are, the inventors, and it just makes you wonder, like, what else can I do with this? That's the point. What can I do with it? Not just these people. Exactly. Right. I completely agree. Now, where do you see the Maker Movement going from here? I see that it will have a significant impact. I mean, it's a revolution in its own right. And the impact will have to be uh, judged in retrospect. Uh, but I think that's going to be in reestablishing craft production, in localizing economics to a large extent as these, this production regrows in local communities. Uh, and uh, the, the money goes with that. It's not all the money. There's still going to be a lot of uh, infrastructural stuff that's produced overseas and, and uh, designed outside of our communities. But I think that increasingly, to an increasing extent, not totally, our products will begin to be defined uh, more locally to us, not simply in the U.S., but in our local communities, in our local regions. Uh, that's, you know, maybe stretching it a little bit, but that's fine. You asked for it. And the, the fundraising, the capital acquisition, the capital accumulation for that gets distributed. We are already seeing this with Kickstarter and Indiegogo and the other uh, crowdfunding events. I think that's exceedingly important because, yes, you do have to follow the money, but the money is now following you uh, in that sense. I will probably attempt to participate in that myself. I've got a product that I'm developing for, it's a STEM product for education. Uh, and I don't have any funding. Uh, I'm just investing my time in the design. But when it comes time to uh, start selling it, we've got the media and we've got the means of raising money. Uh, it's not like I can snap my finger and get all the money I want but I can get a shot at it. Oh darn, <laughs> if only we could, right? <laughs> right, and I think a lot of people, what we're going to see, because crowdfunding is now kind of recognized with this, uh, uh, whatever they call the Jobs Act, I don't know why that's it, but um, the, the, there's going to be a, a certain amount of scam and so forth. There always is when there's uh, something developing. Well, do you have any more insight that I can share with my audience about the maker revolution? Uh, well, I would say uh, learn as much as you can. I mean, I'm looking at a sign saying learn to solder. Yeah, okay, that's right there. And uh, there's going to be more coming along. I mean, it's, it, you haven't missed it. It's still on the rising edge. I think it's still being born right now. Well, yes, and then everybody involved, everybody who wants to can be involved. Uh, it, it, uh, it, there's an awful lot of things that are of less, less usefulness, interest, and fun. Well, what do you say? Let's go check out the uh, expo hall and find out what cool stuff we can find. <laughs> Lee, it was wonderful to speak to you, and let our audience know where they can find more information about you. Well, I have a website, leefelsenstein.com, and you have to know how to spell my name to get that, uh, F-E-L-S-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. Uh, that's the best place, and there's a lot of uh, stuff there I'm going to try to keep putting more, maybe the, hopefully the recording of this talk that I just gave and the slides for it. So that's the best shot. Great. Thank you again, Lee. It was a pleasure talking to you.
You know that the mobile app industry is on fire right now. Full Sail University's online mobile development bachelor's degree program can teach you the skill set you need to take advantage of those emerging opportunities. In this degree, you'll learn both the programming and business sides of mobile development so that you can concept, develop, deploy, and market an application from start to finish. You'll explore advanced programming languages, visual frameworks, usability principles, and app deployment for iOS and Android operating systems. Through Full Sail's Project Launchbox program, students receive a MacBook Pro preloaded with industry software, plus iOS and Android devices. Courses are delivered through Full Sail's immersive online education platform, which maximizes the capabilities of the Mac, giving you a learning experience unlike any other. Between the App Store and Google's Play Store, over 50 billion apps have been downloaded with no signs of slowing down. If you're ready to master the technology and software to compete in this rapidly growing industry, visit fullsail.edu slash hack5 to learn more about this online degree program. This week's Technoless photo of the week comes from Jargon from South Africa. He says, loving the show and watching it mostly on my Blackberry playbook. And FYI, this is an old email. It's been in my inbox for forever. I'm sorry, I just got to it. And make sure to keep up the good work and thank you for all the Technolust. Thank you so much for sharing that Jargon. We really appreciate your photo. And you can always send your photos to feedback at hack5.org with the subject line Technolust.